it didn't look like I was going to be able to receive a transplant. I'm petite, small, and they were preparing me literally to go home to hospice. It was hard for me telling my kids maybe that we will lose him. It was very hard seeing my daughter as well taking the decision to give him the kidney. The only way that they could help me was through a heart transplant. So it became even more unacceptable to me to lose a parent. I was getting sicker, and he says he couldn't do it anymore. He was killing my liver. I was actually dying. And um, they didn't give me a, a very good chance of survival and told my parents to make plans for a funeral. And that was my only option, either lungs or I would not be here. It was the frontier, it was kind of the cutting edge of uh, medical care, uh, taking patients who were on death's doorstep uh, with advanced heart failure or liver failure or kidney failure and giving them a new lease on life. You had a fantastic group of people. They, everybody was dedicated to ensuring that this program succeeded. It wasn't that there was a big fund that brought in this huge team to make it successful. It was. Uh, people in place doing other things that were willing to uh, participate and make it happen. Many people may not appreciate first uh, that as a team, we all joined at the hip. We succeed together and potentially can fail together. When you come across from the parking structure and you see that helicopter landing, it's not just the person carrying that cooler with the organ in it. It's many, many people. We share ideas with each other. We share quality outcomes with each other. We share best practices. So it's a way to really elevate each other. It began on January 4th, 1968, when Betty Jean Alderman received a kidney donation from her mother. The doctors who performed this operation included Emery Zilagi, Joseph Elliott, and Roger Smith, among others. This transplant marked the first of its kind at the hospital, and it was successful. The early transplants were almost always living donor transplant because the risk of rejection was less with living donor transplant. You can match, you had the time to match the donor and the recipient as well as possible. Can you imagine at that time where they had little technology, few medications to use to fight rejection, but people were dying from kidney failure. That is very bold. That was very, very bold. The nurses and the surgeons, the urologists, the vascular surgeons and nephrologists, every time we saw this happen, it was, it was a miracle. It's easier probably to convince people to donate organs uh, in the most recent years than it did before. Uh, People are worried, I'm going to be all right. Uh, you know, of course you're putting yourself at some risk. Living donors are really special people. They're going through an operation that they absolutely do not need. That being said, I think there's a, a lot of literature to support the fact that the, the likelihood of them uh, having long-term adverse outcomes, it's really a very small percentage in the grand scheme of things. We collaborate with each other very well. We, the surgeons, the physicians, the coordinators, we are all in one, you know, I call it the sandbox. Being together, working together, and towards one goal, transplant the patient, keep them alive and happy. In this place, we're always looking forward to be pioneers in uh, a lot of different things. Uh, so we don't hesitate to take the first step in doing it. And I think we would, we're in that early phase of robotic kidney transplant that we're doing it now. We have smaller incisions will we'll definitely have uh, less wound complications overall. Um, we will have a little bit upfront because we were just learning the whole process. But I think uh, in the end, at least my vision, and that's where a lot of things come with vision, is that this can kind of revolutionize the field of or kidney transplant. And I would applaud our ancestors on whom we stand on their shoulders that they opened the door for us. We need to learn from their courage and build on that. Uh, 
It was 1984 when I was asked to take this position with LifeShare. It was a brand new entity that developed at that time. It was designed to uh, capture whatever donors we could. I was on call to come in and talk to families and talk to them about organ donation and what it meant and how to do it and, and all that kind of thing. Most families said no, they didn't know what it was, they didn't know anything about transplantation. As people got educated to the needs through the press and through their experiences and as time went on and they knew people who transplants, it would become more open. And it has. More people are consenting now than ever before. And it's, it's very busy now because of that, but in the old days it wasn't as busy. Everything was done by phone. <laughs> it, was like, it, it wasn't really organized in the way that became smooth. That was why they felt we had a need to, to start something that would fit our needs at, at Henry Ford. Transplant Society of Michigan, the Organ Procurement Agency, had like four employees. Henry Ford Division of Transplant had like seven employees. You know, we're over 100 now. Gift the Life's probably at 300. It's just spectacular, the, the growth that, that came from this. The heart transplant program began in 1985. Everyone was excited, obviously, for the first heart transplant. The operating room was buzzing with the A-team, so to speak, and nobody else could come into the room, wanted to maintain this sterility field. After the patient was done, he spent four to five weeks in the ICU the nurses had to gown, cap, put their booties on, gloves. When they took care of the patient, everybody had to do that. I remember sitting there the first time we did one and it was just amazing how slick the whole process was and how exciting it was to see somebody take a heart out of an ice, ice bag and put it in and sew it in and get it to work. It was pretty dramatic. Well, I was shocked at how well the heart recipients came back after they got their hearts. I was just sh shocked. But it made sense, they had a heart that, that couldn't even give enough energy to stand up and now they have a heart that beats fine and well, they could get up and walk around and do everything they wanted. It's sort of an interesting paradox in many fields, not just surgery, but certainly in surgery, is that uh, you can get the support you need once you demonstrate success, but it's hard to demonstrate success without the support, but that's the story of, of medicine. At the very beginning, we were looking for a perfect candidate because back in 1985, insurance didn't pay for the heart transplant. The first 10 Henry Ford Hospital did the surgery for free and we were very aware of every single person had to be successful. If we had had major problems, it could have shut down the program back then. Support from the leadership standpoint uh, is, is absolutely crucial to grow the program because I can have all the ideas in the world. If no one is helping me to be able to, to put, put it to, to reality by economic support, administrative support, and, and political support, then nothing will happen, nothing will move forward. So without visionary leadership, um, it would be impossible to achieve the task. With the left ventricular assist devices, our patients are no longer dying on the wait list. So they're having the opportunity to get better, have a better quality of life, and survive till they get to their transplantation. So we've already seen this amazing evolution where devices are getting smaller and smaller. They're easier to implant and we're implanting them uh, in patients who are less ill. I think it's very reasonable to expect within the next 10 years that we'll have fully implantable devices, meaning that everything, um, including the battery power and all the brains are within the pump inside the patient. Um, this removes a lot of the quality of life factors that patients face. The candidate was uh, somebody who had biventricular heart failure and kidney failure as well. So a left ventricular assist device alone would not be the solution. And we didn't have a uh, 
offer, a double organ offer uh, immediately. So we implanted the total artificial heart uh, mid-December uh, uh, and then we transplanted this patient mid-February or end of February and he's about to go home now. For nearly every patient we have to step back and think about all the puzzle pieces that go into that surgery. Um, from looking at the right side of the heart to looking at the valves on the left side to understanding how the kidneys work and how the liver is working. And what this team does is it has ability to step back and look at all those individual facets of a patient's illness and put those puzzle pieces into place to try, try to think about the best outcome. Where I began with the program to where the program is gone today, I, I mean, it's like uh, Star Trek almost, you know, beam me up, Scotty. It's gone that quickly. It's a very useful transplant. It's mostly for type 1 diabetics whose pancreas don't produce uh, insulin. A lot of those type 1 diabetics, as well as those type 2 diabetics, end up getting uh, developing kidney failure. And if you can catch them before they get to kidney failure, or if you're able to uh, sort of cure them of their diabetes, even with their kidney uh, transplant, then the diabetes won't ravage the transplanted kidney. When the transplants are successful, it's amazing how independent the patient is with regards to their insulin. They do not have to do constant finger sticks. They do not have to take in, uh, insulin three, four times a day. They are able to function like they were prior to getting diabetes. We're trying to develop ways where more pancreatic can be transplanted into patients from deceased donors. So I think that there is a big push by the government, actually, to try to see if we can utilize uh, more of these organs and try to benefit more diabetics. Normally, uh, transplant programs, liver transplant programs, were built on top of a medical liver program and just, uh, you know, provided the, that surgical option. Uh, but here we didn't have that foundation. I think around 94 or 95, uh, Dr. Abeljud uh, came back to Henry Ford Hospital from his training as a transplant surgeon uh, elsewhere, and he came over and took over the program Serendipitously, at the same time, we were recruiting our first hepatologist. Dr. Brown came on board. It was a good, good year for the program because we finally had some really key components that we needed from, from day one, actually. I saw uh, a very young program uh, with a lot of very dedicated people. And within that, I saw a lot of opportunity. Uh, because we could really make it our own and we had a lot of support from uh, the people within the system at the time and they really gave us the resources that we needed and stepped back and let us build the kind of program that we thought would be world class. There are various aspects of liver transplant which have to be covered besides medical part, surgical part. You need the social service, dietitian, transplant coordinators to make sure that everything is done properly and in a sequence. Living donor liver transplant um, is one of those, what I call the most complicated procedures from a technical standpoint and a psychosocial standpoint. So the first patient was a, was a patient of mine, Ella Bullock. And uh, what I remember about uh, Ella more than anything else was she was just an outstanding patient. And she had a, a daughter who was willing to donate. 
and who was also very mature, very strong, and we just we just felt like this was a really good opportunity. We had an amazing team, surgeons and anesthesiologists and nurses and physicians that we crossed the T's, dotted the I's, and we were we were there. We were ready. I remember the day of the transplant uh, vividly because uh, we were all nervous and uh, Marwan was just sort of sending out word from the operating room and we'd hear what was going on. At one point he said they were starting to put the liver into the recipient. A bunch of us went down to the operating room and uh, things had gone well and we were really excited. It was just a great moment. You know, even without living donor, you know, we felt that we were evolving, we were growing, we were becoming one of the significant programs in the upper Midwest, but that, that really, uh, even more so took us to, to a level where we felt like we as a program were, uh, you know, able to offer just anything that anyone in the country could offer. I always say our living donors are angels on earth. These are living individuals who go through a big operation risking their health and they say, sign me up. When? It takes an amazing individual to do that. As far as you know, innovation technology-wise goes, we have you know lots of new things. Whether it be um, the liver assisted devices, you know, we have kidney pumps that we started incorporating pretty much about um, ten years ago. That the Gift of Life uh, Michigan has um, set up for all kidneys to be pumped that are above a certain age. And then now we're doing the same thing with livers. That's really changed dramatically too. If we're able to save more lives consistently and try to reduce the number of um, deaths on the wait list, which is right now sitting around 10 to 12 percent in the country, I think that's a, that'll be a huge impact. We uh, have excellence in many, many fields. And liver transplant and other transplants have become a real source or point of excellence for Henry Ford Hospital. I have to give credit to Jackie Brooks. She was the first person who had faith in me and us as a program to go through this life-threatening big operation, not knowing that she would come out on the other end, knowing it was the first time we'd done it. The, the courage that our recipients have to accept organs, knowing that they may die as complications of the surgery or may not have the best outcome, but for that chance to live and improve, uh, it's pretty remarkable courage. I think the biggest challenge is for me was to obviously learn about lung transplantation. And then the other thing was just when I get, got back to Henry Ford Hospital was to start seeing a bunch of patients who might be candidates for lung transplantation. The first transplants that were done um, throughout this country actually were not successful because the people that were chosen were bed bound and not able to get up and not able to walk. Our ability to handle the patient and better stratify the patients from a risk perspective improved a lot with, with experience over time. So we're able to, to help patients who would not have been helped about 15, 20 years ago. Decades later, we now have successful transplant programs where the success rate is approaching 95% for liver, heart, lung. And uh, that's a testament to the early pioneers and the people who've contributed to the success of the transplant enterprise. We have that chance to take the organs out of the donor uh, environment, put it on the machine to optimize the situation and many times we're able to salvage these lungs to put them and transplant them. Again, those organs would have gone to waste otherwise. These lung transplant patients have that ability to breathe and take a big deep breath and be satisfied. Uh, it really is a huge improvement in the quality of their life. And then it has, uh, over the course of time, advantages in terms of the length of their lives without worrying about infections and other problems that normally come along with chronic lung disease. We started from zero, ground zero, and we set up the clinical program, the collection, 
um, facility and the um, bone marrow processing freezing facility. So because the goal is cure, not control, we do different kinds of transplant. Um, we started simple and then grew into um, the most modern one that offers every kind of transplant um, that's um, available. The stem cell transplant that I had was doing was essentially rebooting my immune system. So it was taking my bone marrow, chemotherapy kills it all off, and then the stem cells essentially regrow a new immune system using my donor's DNA. There are a lot of, a lot of misconceptions that people have about stem cells in general, about the donation process, about how painful the donation process is. And thinking to join the registry is a painful process, but all it is is a cheek swab. And then you wait and see if you match with someone. That's something everybody can do. because there were many things in common between a solid organ transplant and bone marrow transplant. So that kind of stimulated the growth. And then uh, we went from 48 transplants a year to um, 93, 94 transplants a year. So um, I really appreciate the support from Henry Ford Transplant Institute. Multivisceral transplant refers to um, transplanting a number of organs together. The liver, the intestine, the pancreas, and the stomach uh, would so often be transplanted together. We see patients who are have a very low quality of life who are looking to us sometimes in desperation, and we are able to offer them something unique and some hope and a chance to try to turn around their condition. Intestinal transplant number is much smaller than other organ transplant. Liver transplant, 7,000 in the, in the nationwide. Intestinal transplant, only 150 to 200. There's less than 10 programs uh, who are certified in the country. And because of the immunosuppression problem and the complex nature of managing these patients, I think a lot of programs shy away from this type of a program. It worked out fantastic considered it was one of the first. And the way they worked everything, they were so professional. It was just like, you guys have done this before or something? They made me feel like, you're gonna be all right. And I am. You know, I trust them with my life. I think the big heroes are the patients themselves, as well as uh, the intestinal transplant coordinators and the dietitians who listen to the day-to-day -day, um, complaints of the patients and try to address things in a timely manner. As long as we have great motivation and passion and then great teamwork, our future is going to be very bright. In my post-transplant visits, I always ask questions to the point that my poor physician would say, Mrs. Rubenstein, so many questions. You are the recipient of a wonderful, beautiful transplant. My comment was, look, I understand I have a great transplant and I am healthy in every respect, but I want to be able to take care of it. I need instructions my family needs to understand you know what they can do what they can't do he says well he said I guess you're gonna have to write an owner's manual that's the day I became a community organizer the physician had no idea what path he had sent me on but I'm forever thankful for him to be challenging me in every way and basically my concept was focusing on the four key areas that I personally found 
were helpful, and I was focusing on attitude, compliance, exercise, and support. ACE is simple, but I presented the concept to Dr. Abajud. He said, you know what, that's the missing link. That's the missing link. He said, I'd like for you to do this for the whole Transman Institute. You're addressing the patient portion, the lifestyle, what you need to do when you go home. I'd never thought about it that way. It started at the Transman Institute with the program, the TLC program, the Transmit Living Community, which developed into um, trained volunteers who serve as pure lifestyle coaches. We teach ACEs classes. We teach patients how to live as Transmit recipients successfully, how to work with their Transmit team. Today, this commitment to finding better solutions has propelled the team to reach for new discoveries, leading the way to delivering the gift of life to thousands more. We all work for the patient every day. We're always pulling in the same direction. Our main aim is to keep the patient happy, have them survive, keep their graft surviving, and uh, satisfaction. When you go back 30 years into a career, you're gonna have these moments that say, it was meaningful, it was impactful, you know, and I'm very lucky and fortunate that I have those moments. It was challenging because it was uh, difficult. It was difficult, you know. Every time we did a transplant and we made it work and we got the patient home and healthy and happy was a victory. When you see the patient awake and coming off the ventilator with stable vitals, um, it, has, it, warms, it warms our heart. I mean, it makes all the effort, all the long nights, and all the worries worthwhile when you see someone improving. That's, this, this is the fuel that keeps us going as, as surgeons. Seeing all of these people, whether they're hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, bowels, what have you, get a second chance at life. That is the reward. It's hard to put into words how much gratitude I feel for Henry Ford. They save people. It's not about this and that. It's just about the simplest thing of waking up in the morning and just getting up and feeling good is a blessing. Everybody keeps saying, oh, your daughter's a saint. <laughs> so she's my donor daughter, you know, yeah. It means everything to me. It's an unbelievable gift. It's just something I don't take lightly. I think about my donor family on a daily basis, and I'm just so thankful and grateful for them. And the entire lung transplant staff, everyone has uh, just been absolutely phenomenal. I'm forever thankful. My strongest passion and drive is to honor my dear donor. The quality of life I received from this heart transplant and the longevity I'm very much thankful.